Good morning. It is so good to see you. We've got light, but not heat yet. <laughs> I hear that's coming later this week. Glad you're here for those of you who are on campus and also those of you who are online. Um, didn't John do an amazing job last week? Powerful message on processing grief, just amazing. And uh, Tony and Susan Martirana, what an amazing uh, story they have to tell. And if you didn't get a chance to hear their full story, uh, on, uh, it's available online on our podcast. Uh, what makes you anxious? What makes you anxious? A anxiety is a motion where we feel like something is threatened. So like if we're a student and there's a test coming up, we're anxious because we're not completely sure that we've studied properly or that we've mastered the material. If you go to a doctor and they give you a prognosis, we can have anxiety because it might affect the quality of our life or even the quantity of our life. Some of us uh, get anxious when we're not in control of something. Some of us get anxious when things are going well and we just wait for the other shoe to drop. And anxiety is one of those things where we feel that something we care about is threatened, might be taken from us. Throughout scripture, we're surprised in this series to discover that God is a God of emotions. He has emotions, that we don't expect this from him. A God who is God of the whole universe and, and there's so many billion people on our planet, how could he actually care about any of us. And so we're surprised when we in scripture see that he has joy, he has sorrow, he has grief, he has anger. All of these are emotions. And why this matters is because you and I have been created in his image and in his likeness, which means we have emotions. And uh, uh, let me just check. How many here have no emotions? <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, emotions can be denied, and no emotions can be ignored. But what we're learning is that we can actually name them and we can process what's going on underneath the surface. Emotions tell us something's going on. It's like the dashboard of your car when, the, when an engine light comes on or oil light comes on. The light itself is not the, the issue, but it's telling you there's something that needs attention. And our emotions tell us there's something that needs attention in our life. So we want to focus today on anxiety. There's a very famous passage. It's in Philippians, and it's in the fourth chapter. And it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, our anxiety can make us defensive. We, we want to keep people out, concerned what might happen if we let them in. Our, our anxiety can make us protective of what we own or those we care about. Our anxiety can make us reactive. We don't really think through something. We just react to something. And anxiety can actually wind up determining our priorities. We're reacting out of fear. Instead of deciding what we think is the best thing to do, we just respond or react to the thing that scares us the most. And so we can wind up taking actions that are not great or failing to take actions that are absolutely necessary. <clears throat> so the passage tells us, do not be anxious, which sounds like a command, which makes us anxious because we're already violating the command. <laughs> How am I supposed to get out of this? But it's not a command. It's a comfort. It's the most repeated phrase from angels and God throughout the scripture. Don't be afraid. Why does he say it? Because we are. We're afraid. So many things to be afraid of. 
And so he says, <clears throat> don't be afraid. The same way you would say to a little child who is afraid, maybe there's a thunderstorm, they come running into your bedroom and, and, and they're scared. And, and what do you say? You say, it's all right, you don't have to be afraid. And then you say something right else, I'm here. And didn't you read that in the passage? Let your gentleness be made known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be afraid. The Lord is near. In every situation you feel anxious about, you have options available to you. In every situation you feel anxiety, you have options that are available to you. And that is in every single area of your life. And the Apostle Paul tells us what they are. And the first thing he says is to pray. Why is that important? Because prayer reminds us of two very important things. The first thing is this, is that we are not alone. That we're not in this all by ourselves. And the second thing it reminds us is we are not in control. If you want to have more anxiety, I don't recommend it, but if you want to have more anxiety, just try to go all by yourself and, and go with the attitude that everything depends on you. And you will be an anxious wreck before you know it. You just will. So, well, what, what am I supposed to pray about? Oh. I've got good news for you. If you can worry about anything, you can pray about anything. Some of us, if we prayed all of our worries, we would be praying without ceasing. <laughs> My sister used to tell me, worrying works. I said, really, how's that? She says, yeah, most of the things I worry about never happen, so that must work. I go, that doesn't sound right to me. Uh, what do you wish things were like? What would you like to see changed? What do you need to face the challenges that you're with? These are all opportunities for prayer. And they're opportunities for us to be able to grow in the midst of all of that. Then he says petition. Petition is a very specific kind of word, and it has to do with an urgent need. What's the most specific thing you absolutely need right now? And you can pray that. And then it says, with thanksgiving, which literally means, the word literally translates as this, be thankful to God for his grace. Why is that important? Because a lot of us in our prayers, we think we're on a point earning system. And when I've, when I've gained enough points, like a video game, right? You, you get your, your score up high enough, then you, you can get more stuff. And that, that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Everything is grace. We don't deserve it, and God gives it to us anyway. Is there anybody in the house that is glad God gives us more than we deserve? Yeah? What do you think? I think so. So don't just focus on the problems or complain about the problems. Ask. That's the way we take action. Ask God for help. Invite God into the thing. And what does it say? And the peace of God, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Now, this is really interesting to me because a lot of us think that the peace of God means everything around us gets quiet and calm. So if I, if I pray, all of a sudden, you and your spouse will get along again. You and the kids will get along again. The kids and the kids will get along again. You and your parents will get along again. You and your friends will get along again. Everything will be wonderful. Your car won't run out of gas. Just be great. Hmm. Peace is something that happens on the inside that is not connected to or driven by the things that are happening on the outside. And that happens when we bring God into the situation. And it tells us that this thing that God is doing on the inside of us actually transcends our understanding. There are things we do not understand, but this is important. This is important. Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean that it's not real or it doesn't work. God's peace does not require our understanding. It requires our prayer. And anyone can pray. And it says, well, guard your hearts and your minds. What, what does that mean? Well, guard your hearts and your minds. Well, God's peace guards like a uh, like secret service. Your hearts and your mind. I was in Florida yesterday, 
and uh, uh, trying to top off my vitamin D for the year. <laughs> and uh, uh, we got to the airport and uh, uh, we, we were getting ready to leave and the planes were not going up or coming down. I couldn't figure out what was going on. The weather was fine. And it wasn't until we finally got, I, I got in at one o'clock this morning. I know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I found out why. And it's because the vice president of the United States happened to be landing in the same airport that we were and, and there was a motorcade. And as it turns out, when the vice president or the president goes into an airport, nothing else goes up and nothing else comes down. They got secret service. When I was in the airport, anybody had access to me. <laughs> it's just true, right? But if, if you are the president or the vice president, you're not going to get within a country mile of, of them. And I was just sitting there thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great to fly like the president or the vice president? Just, yeah. And we would inconvenience a lot of people, wouldn't we? Yeah. And then I thought to myself, I know this is an unchristian thought. <laughs> I don't know if God heard it or not, but I'll tell you. I was thinking, you know, once you've been president, flying must be terrible. It just must be terrible. You, you have to wait, you have to sit when they tell you to sit. You, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, guard your hearts and your minds. The, the heart in Scripture is never referred to as the organ that pumps your body, pumps blood in your body. It's, it's the place where, where your desires are. It's the place where your decisions are made. And God says that when we pray, his peace starts acting like secret service around us to guard the decisions that we're going to make and the desires that we're going to pursue and our mind, which is, which is our, what, what our perceptions of things are, what our conclusions that we come to are. And, and then he tells us this, change your focus. So pray. Then change your focus. You know, a lot of us could change our focus just by doing this. Uh, while I was away, I was on the beach as much as I possibly could. But one day there was a school trip that came in and over 500 students came. 500 students to my beach. <laughs> I was just so glad to see them. And they came onto the beach and they stood there the whole day. I'm not kidding. They stood there, 500, shoulder to shoulder, stood there the whole day. <laughs> Change your focus because what we focus on tends to produce anxiety in us. What can we focus on? Focus on what is true. Not is it true that they said it, is what they said true. What is noble? What produces awe in you? Something that's awesome, something that's awe-inspiring. Think intentionally, focus on that. What is right? What's the right? thing to do? What's pure? What's innocent? What's lovely? We're surrounded by beauty that mostly we don't notice. There's so much beauty in our world in a single day, and yet we can miss so much of it, but we could focus on it. We could decide to identify it. What is admirable? Things that deserve respect. What is praiseworthy? Things that we can accurately and appropriately acknowledge in our life. And this is what the Apostle Paul says about that. He says, practice these things. Practice. Some of us think our faith is fake because this doesn't come automatically. And we find ourselves being afraid. And well, I guess the peace of God isn't for me or I must be doing my faith wrong. No, Paul says practice, practice, practice praying, praying about what? About everything. Invite God into everything all the time. Practice 
thanking God for his grace because it reminds us, I don't get from him what I deserve. I get from him what he wants to give me, which is always good. And then we practice changing our focus. Now, there's a really interesting character in the Old Testament. His name is Elijah. And Elijah is a piece of work. Uh, he is, he is, well, he's just a really interesting guy. First Kings 19 tells us something that happened in his life. The previous chapter tells us about a confrontation that he had. He threw out a contest to 450 prophets of a false god named Baal. The nation of Israel kind of wandered spiritually, and so he called as many people together as would come, and he told the 450 prophets, he says, let's both build altars, let's both put sacrifices on our altars, and let's pray, and whatever God answers by fire, then everybody can choose what God they're going to serve. And the 450 prophets put on quite a show, but there was no fire. And then Elijah put on his show. He prayed, and fire came down from heaven and licked up the entire sacrifice. It was, it was impressive. And, and you would think that this is a good day. But those 450 prophets answered to a single person. That single person they answered to was a queen, and her queen's name was Jezebel. And Jezebel had such a reputation that to this day, nobody, nobody calls their kids Jezebel. Nobody. If anybody calls you Jezebel, it's never a compliment. Never. And, uh, and she said, because you defeated my prophets, I'm going to kill you. And it terrified. This is what the Bible says about Elijah. He was afraid and he ran for his life. Why was he afraid? Because she had killed before. She killed because her husband wanted a piece of property. And the person wouldn't sell it to the king. And she had that man killed and then took it. So she was that kind of person. And the challenge for Elijah is you would think he goes, 450 false prophets, what's one more woman? He doesn't do that. He runs for his life. Why? Because things did not go as he thought. God answers by fire. 450 false prophets are defeated. Things are supposed to go better now, right? Not how it went. Instead, there's a hit put out on him, and he's going to be killed. And so he runs for his life. He's exhausted. He's depleted. He's disappointed. And he takes off running. Elijah, did, and it says this, he didn't want to live anymore. He told God, just take my life from me. I don't want to live anymore. Because when you're exhausted and when you're anxious, that's a thought that will come to you. That's a thought that will come to you. And uh, so, how did God respond to Elijah? He goes as far as he can, and he just lays down under a bush, and he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, an angel had prepared some food for him and taps him on the shoulder and says, get up and eat. And he eats, and he goes back to sleep. And the angel prepares another meal and taps him on the shoulder and says, get up and eat. How is that spiritual? What is it? Sleep. Eat something nutritious. I had a terrible bout with anxiety. Anxiety attacks affected me horribly. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And it was actually a combination of a few things. One was a series of losses, grief that I had not processed, and then I was living at a pace that was unsustainable. I just, I wasn't sleeping like I should sleep. And uh, I would come into church and, and I wouldn't know if I could get through a service or not. My, my heart was pounding. I used to tell the executive pastor, Jonathan, if I go down, my notes are on the pulpit, just step over me and finish the message. And... Uh, I shared this with counsel so that they were aware. I've had an accountability partner for over 20 years. I cannot tell you what an invaluable resource it is to have a person that you've been sharing your life with for over 20 years. So I said, well, I don't have a 20-year accountability partner. You could start today. And in 20 years, you'll have 20 years. And a Christian counselor, my family. And the result was I was able to put my life back in order. 
And it started with, for Elijah, and honestly for me, get some rest, eat some healthier food. And then he told him, he says, the, the journey that you're about to take is, is too much for you. That's why you need this strength. And he goes to a place called Horeb, which is interestingly enough in scripture, they think it's the theologians believe it's where, where Moses saw the burning bush. He goes to Horeb and he has a, a, a conversation with God. And God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And Elijah responds this way. He says, I have been passionate in serving you and the nation of Israel has forsaken your covenants and they have destroyed all the places where sacrifices were made and prayers were prayed and they killed the prophets and I'm the only one that's left. And so God said, um, I'm about to meet with you. Go out and stand on the mountain. So he goes out and he stands on the mountain and there's this incredible windstorm that comes. This isn't just a heavy breeze. This is, this is worse than a hurricane. It's actually moving rocks, blowing them into each other and they're shattering. I mean, it's, it's just watching this, this demolition on the side of the mountain. And then, and, but it says, but God was not in the wind. And then there's an earthquake and the ground under him, it's, it's like it's, it's, it's all of a sudden water waves that he's, he's trying to ride out. And, but God wasn't in, in the earthquake. And then there's a fire that comes and just consumes everything on the side of the mountain. And God was not in the fire. And then there was a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard that, he went out to the mouth of the cave. And God asked him the same question, why are you here? And Elijah gives the same answer. You can read all about this in 1 Kings 19. He said, I passionately served you and your nation has forsaken its covenant. And they've destroyed the places where people made sacrifices and prayed prayers. They've killed the prophets. And I'm the only one that's left. Because Listen to this. You would think that when you are anxious, a display of incredible wind that destroys even rocks or an earthquake that makes the ground seem like waves of the sea or a fire that consumes anything and everything, you would think that that would be enough to reset you, but it isn't. It's the gentle whisper of God in our lives that resets us. And this is what God tells him. Go back the way you came. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Go back the way you came. Why would he have him go back the way he came? Well, there's a couple reasons. He wanted Elijah to retrace in his mind, to recall and remember how he came to be a follower of God to begin with how he came to be called into ministry. What is it that made you a, a believer in the true and the living God? What is it that activated you to do something that mattered in this world? And he wanted Elijah to go back to that, but he also wanted him to go back to because there were kings that needed to be anointed and there were other leaders that needed to be raised up. And what he's telling them is, is your work is not done. And by the way, there's 7,000 people who haven't bowed a knee to Baal. You're not alone. You're just isolated. It's not the same thing. And so I have a question for you today. How much anxiety is, is managing your life when it comes to a decision or something that you're facing? The family's going to get together. You say, oh God, I, just, I don't know if I can do that. You keep waiting for the person that you think you love more than anyone else in the world to tap out of the relationship. An adolescent voice who's frustrated with you over something you won't let them have or won't let them do and you're worried that they're going to go off on a trajectory that will wreak havoc for the rest of their life. 
There's a pain. There's something that's not getting better. And our mind can jump to every negative conclusion. Your kid can be five minutes late getting home. You're already terrified. What are you going to do? Are you going to spend the rest of your life living like that? Because that's exactly what our culture is leaned into right now. And what's absolutely terrifying is you don't have to be in your 40s, 50s, or 60s to be anxious. Anxiety is becoming an uncontrolled reality at younger and younger and younger and younger and younger levels. You want to know why we have children's ministry, which is packed to capacity around here, and student ministry, which is packed to capacity around here, and young adult ministry? Why do we do those things? Because every single age group needs to know that God is real and God cares and God is available, and they can pray and they can change their focus and God can do something else with their life. Would you bow your heads with me today? Father, for those who are struggling with anxiety and they actually feel like they failed in their faith because of it, would you help them know today that your son is standing by your side right at this moment and praying that their faith would not fail and the prayers of Jesus do not return void. Not ever, not one time. Their faith is not going to fail. Help us change our focus to the gifts that you have given us and help us trust you to do good things again in our lives. In the name of your son, Jesus, and all who agreed with that prayer said, would you stand with me this morning?